اعوذ باللہ السمیع العلیم من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین الحمدللہ والحمد حقه کما يستحقه حمدا کثیرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم سلام وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا Amanna billahi sadaqallahu al-aliyyu al-azim for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior ajallahu ta'ala farajhu al-sharif enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. His name is chanted by hundreds of millions around the world. His name continues to inspire those who have been oppressed, granting them hope, light, and mercy. His name places fear and trembles the hearts of the oppressors and the tyrants. His remembrance continues to grow from strength to strength. He is referred to, mourned, eulogized, cried over by millions around the world today. He is Hussein, the son of Ali, the grandson of the Holy Prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The history of mankind has shown us many human beings that stand today to be inspirational individuals. People who have come forward and changed the course of history. Individuals who have made a difference to the lives of many human beings. People who have sacrificed, people who have written, people who have challenged status quo, individuals that people today stand to honor 
examples like Mahatma Gandhi, people like Martin Luther King, ladies like, Ter like Mother Teresa, people like Nelson Mandela, all these and many more are individuals that people classify under inspirational. They may remember them, they may uh, honor them, they may write books about them, make movies about them. Some of them, their birth and their death may be commemorated. But there is no man who inspires so many like Hussein ibn Ali. When we say this, when we say this, what do we mean? Of course, when we talk about Sayyid al-Shuhada being a man who inspires and motivates and places hope in the hearts of so many individuals, this is in no shape or form placing him above the Holy Prophet or Amir al-Mu'mineen. Why? Because the inspiration for Aba Abdullah is Rasulullah and Amir al-Mu'mineen. And indeed, we find the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Famously stating, Husseinun minni wa ana min Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Ahab Allah, man ahab Husseina. Whomsoever loves Hussein, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love them. Tell me, give me a name other than Hussein of an individual who draws over 20 million human beings to walk to commemorate over a period of two to three weeks every year to constitute the world's largest peaceful gathering. Tell me a name other than Hussein of a man who is remembered in all corners around the world, in all the continents, by millions of human beings who are not forced, yet they attend, yea cry, they beat their chests and they call out his name. Tell me of a name other than Hussein, of a man who has been the source of inspiration for those seeking justice, for those fighting oppression and injustice, for the revolutionaries, for those who have sought success in this world and the hereafter. Tell me of a name of another person than Hussein, who has indeed bought so much hope in the minds and in the hearts of mankind. Indeed, this is the legacy of Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. That's why today we stand in admiration of the life of this illustrious individual because of his inspiration, because of his light. There are so many examples for you and I to delve into of people who have discovered the inspiration that is Aba Abdullah al Hussein from the 10th of Muharram, those around him, including the children. A young boy who had reached the age of 10 or 11 walks to the grandson of the Holy Prophet, says to him, my master, Aba Abdullah, my father was slaughtered in the battlefield and I have come to continue to stand alongside you to sacrifice my life for you. Tell me what kind of inspiration is this? That a young child will stand to what? To defend and to fight. Likewise, we have incidences and stories throughout history of people making all the effort despite the difficulties and the challenges and the hardships to visit the shrine of Aba Abdullah like that woman who would go towards the shrine of Imam al Hussein in Karbala despite al Mutawakkil al Abbasi saying that the limbs will be amputated and chopped off. When she reached close to Karbala, the guards look at her. They said, did you not hear that the caliph had said that your limbs would be cut off? She said, I did. They said, give us your left arm, we'll chop it off. She said, I'll give you my left arm because my right is already chopped off because I came last year. Yes, these are examples. And today we find people in many parts of the world, like that individual who says, I was fighting the people of the shaitan. The people who respond to the shaitan and are his manifestations on earth, the terrorists, the extremists, the so-called ISIS, ISIL or Daesh, 
this individual who is fighting them amongst the people in Iraq who had responded to the call of the Marja'iyah. He says, I was fighting in the battlefield alongside some of my friends. We were fighting intensely until the call was given to us that we are surrounded, that there is no way out. We are only a few of us had remained. Some of my friends had obtained martyrdom. There was nothing else for us to do than to embrace martyrdom. He said at that moment there was one name in my mind and that was Aba Abdullah. I stood up. He said, let me join the caravan of martyrdom. I stood up and I said, Labbayka ya Hussein. I went towards them. I said, I will not allow them to capture us and decapitate us like how savage and inhumane and brutal these individuals are. He said, as soon as I said, Labbayka ya Hussein, and we charged a few of us, there was a helicopter who came and destroyed those particular individuals. Right. And today we are alive to tell the story of how Hussein inspires us. A man who had given four of his sons as martyrs fighting the evil that is ISIL or Daesh. Four of his sons had obtained martyrdom, yet he had none of their bodies. He was not able to bury them. He was not able to mourn for them. He came to whom? To Ayatollah al-Udma Sistani Hafizahullah. He said to him, I wish to dig four graves and just mourn for my four sons. Can I do that? The marja' tells him no. Instead to go to Aba Abdullah, visit the companions of Hussein because your four sons are with his companions. Yes, this is the inspiration that is Aba Abdullah. Today, when you and I mourn and stand to honor the legacy of this great individual, his family, his companions, the question that should be asked is, how does Aba Abdullah al Hussein inspire me? In which way do I look at the life of this holy individual to seek the betterment of my life and the life of the community and the society that I live in? There's no doubt when we examine the current situation, especially in 2015, of the challenges and the problems that we in the Muslim community are facing both internationally as well as locally. Many in the world today are talking and are gripped by what is happening in different parts of the world relating to the international terrorism. We find these particular individuals who have hijacked the beautiful name of the religion of Islam, killing indiscriminately women, children, the elderly, Muslim and non-Muslim in many parts of the world, perpetrating heinous crimes. We find them spreading their venom, not only in Iraq and Syria, but also in places like Kuwait, where during the month of Ramadan, over 30 obtained martyrdom whilst they're in what? In the masjid performing Salatul Jumu'ah whilst in the state of fasting. In Saudi, so many have been slaughtered this year whilst in the act of worship, including during these 10 days of Muharram, where five of our brothers, they were leaving the Majlis of Aba Abdullah in a village close to Ahsa, and they what? They were shot by these particular individuals. Yes, we look at Pakistan, where only yesterday over 14 were slaughtered, what? After attending the Majlis of Aba Abdullah, daily killings in places like Karachi and other places. We look at Yemen, where many people are being killed due to the aggression. We look at Syria where many people are now trapped and due to this vicious civil war and the problems that arise because of the what the refugees and the exodus where the United Nations says today that it estimates over 800,000 refugees what will go to Western Europe by next year by 2016. We look at this and much more. Around us in the West, you and I are facing so many of the challenges like what? Like the rise when it comes to Islamophobia.
like the concept or the people's misunderstanding of the religion of Islam, like issues that many of us have been disturbed by. Examples, a presidential candidate, a Republican presidential candidate, Ben Carson comes forward and says what? He says, I cannot see and Muslims cannot be presidents of this country. We find innocent people like those three in Chapel Hill, those three Muslims killed for no reason whatsoever. We find what? We find examples of hatred and animosity and bigotry in many parts, not only in this country, but of course in other parts in the Western world, whereby churches have been attacked, whereby shootings such as those in Ferguson have demonstrated what? Has demonstrated higher incidents of racism and so on. All this and more are indicative of the challenges as an example when it comes to combating what? When it comes to combating Islamophobia or extremism or terrorism. How does Imam al Hussein, peace and blessings be upon him, inspire us as Muslims living in the United States, as Muslims living in the West, to combat? these aspects that many of us are facing today and that brings us first and foremost to look at what to look at the emphasis that imam alayhi salam placed within the teachings of the religion of islam associated with what with the notion of mercy and tolerance right. how when we look at the holy quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in over 600 places 600 occasions in the Holy Quran speaks about his mercy. He states, Kataba ala nafsihi rahma. He has made it incumbent upon himself that mercy is demonstrated and manifested. We indeed know that he created everything due to his mercy. We know that what the greatest ayah in the Holy Quran begins with what? begins with two of the divine attributes out of no more than 140 that are mentioned in the Quran. Allah chooses two which are what? Which are both related to his mercy. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are told that the Prophet of Islam was sent as a mercy to mankind. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Question, if Allah is so merciful, does not, not make us individuals who should strive to apply mercy in our lives. Should not we be of those who demonstrate the values and the principles associated with Rahmah, with kindness, with respect, and with what? With tolerance. When we look around the world today, we face so much hatred, social injustice, People out there want to demonize the other. People out there want to what, bring the other down. Sometimes use violence. All kinds of things are spreading in the name of the religion of Islam sometimes. This is the moment to reflect and to apply and to understand that the religion of Islam is the religion of mercy. And this is not something that we just say and mention as people have heard, but we actually demonstrate it in our practice. How? We are told that the religion focuses so much when it comes to tolerance and respect to the extent that many of us are unaware of the narrations that exist that highlight the what? The fact that we are not even supposed to what? Hurt an animal, let alone a human being. There are narrations that the Prophet of Islam, Rasul al A'dham Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saw a group of people pelting a chicken or a hen. He said, who are these people? They said, Ya Rasulullah, they are this and this and this. According to Sunan Ibn Majah, according to a number of texts of hadith, the Prophet of God would say, Allah has sent his la'na upon these people. Just for what? Hurting an animal. Tell me, a religion that looks after the rights of animals, what does it say when it comes to human beings? Yes, today there is a need for us to appreciate and understand what the religion of Islam has presented and propagated when it comes to demonstrating tolerance in society. This day today, 
I had the honor to be at Westminster, at uh, Washington National Cathedral. There, there were Muslim leaders, there were Christian leaders, there were Jewish leaders. They had congregated for a prayer inside the cathedral and to sign a pledge, a pledge that would demonstrate the what? Denouncing of any discrimination any bigotry, any harassment, and attack of people of faiths to allow them to practice freely. This is what? Something that what the religion of Islam has presented and indeed has emphasized. The Prophet of Islam one day was with an individual who is a Bedouin. The Bedouin said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to pray a special dua. The Prophet said, what is this dua? He said, pray that only me and you go to Jannah. The Prophet looked at him and said, you are limiting that which cannot be limited. <laughs> the mercy of God, you cannot limit it. You want to limit it just for both, both of us? Amir al muminin wa Imam al muttaqin the symbol when it comes to what? When it comes to respect and tolerance. What does he say? He says to Malik al-Ashtar in Nahju al in his direction, he says, when you come to the people, treat them with love and kindness. Yes, forgive those who have wronged you. Why? Because people are of two kinds, either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity. And Amir al muminin would not just say this, but put it in action in Safin. Yes, in Safin, the water was stopped from reaching the army of Amir al muminin and they were forced to go and fight in order to get access to the water, fight the army of Muawiyah. When they did so, now the water was in their hands. Some of his army members said to the Imam, Oh Imam, now we will prevent them from reaching the water. He says, no, not at all. We will allow them. We will not be like them. That despite those individuals in the army of Muawiyah coming to attack the Imam, coming to stand against him and shedding blood, he would not stop them from accessing the water. Tell me what kind of mercy that is. Yes. <laughs> What do we find? We find that there is a need for you and I to develop the understanding when it comes to dealing with people that we do not necessarily agree with, but to live coexistently, to live with respect, with dignity, to carry the message of Aba Abdullah. Aba Abdullah stood for what? For freedom. He would say to those who attacked his caravan or his campsite, if you have no religion, have no affiliation, then at least be free in this world. Free from what? Free from racism, free from bigotry, free from hatred. What would he do? He would also, when it comes to the army of Hur, a man in the army of Hur who had come to what? To stop Aba Abdullah, Imam al Hussein, reaching Kufa. What does he say? He says, when I reached where what the army was there, I was thirsty. Yes, when I got there, an individual came and spoke to me in the dialect of the people of Hijaz. I did not understand. He then repeated. He said to me, come down so that I feed you water. I came down. He fed me water. Then he said, lower your horse so that I feed your horse water. I lowered my horse. He fed my horse water. I walked away. I spoke to people. I said to them, this is what happened. They, saw, they said, we saw this. Do you not know who that man was? He he said, I don't know. They said this was the grandson of the Holy Prophet Hussein ibn Ali. <laughs> that when Aba Abdullah al Hussein stands on the 10th of Muharram, looks at those individuals and sheds the tears, yes, sheds the tears, so much mercy in his heart, so much love in his heart. Today, this is one of the most important messages that we have to carry forward. Why? You ask me. Because I tell you, when it comes to public opinion, when it comes to what people think about Muslims, it's truly saddening.
Yes? In the United Kingdom, this year, in June, they conducted a survey by a company by the name of YouGov. They asked over 6,000 people about terms that they associate with different groups. They said to them, what's the most common term that you associate with Islam and Muslims? Do you know what was the answer? Terrorism. Yes? In this country, there is a, a think tank by the name of the Zogby Analytics. They also conduct a number of surveys across the United States. In 2010, they asked many people across the states about their impression of Muslims, whether it was favorable or not. In 2010, 36% said they had a favorable opinion about Muslims and Islam. They did the same last year in 2014, and the result was 27%. It dropped from 36% to 27%. No doubt that the impact of extremist ideologies like Daesh or ISIS and Wahhabism, which is the ideology of ISIS, no doubt that has had an impact on the minds of human beings and people who are non-Muslims when it comes to understanding what Islam is all about, yes? No doubt that that has had an impact because I remember one day I was at a live show on one of the Shia satellite channels. I was answering questions and an individual, whilst I was in the UK from the United States, called. He said, excuse me, this is the first time I call a Muslim channel. Yes, and I saw you speaking about your prophet, about the people that you respect and the love and the mercy. But can I just tell you, I was flicking through the channels and I heard you. Can I tell you that I do not, I do not agree with you? I disagree with you. I said, why? He said, live on the television, what you say is not being corresponded with what I see. I see brutality. I see beheadings. I see people taking out organs and chewing it. That's what I see. Is this your Islam? This must make us think. And today, the challenge for all of us is to make an participation in society to represent the true values of Islam the Islam of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad the Islam of peace and tolerance the Islam of coexistence the Islam of living happily with other the Islam of respect that's why there is a need for us to learn from the 10th of Muharram and ask this all-important question what is our role as far as the inspiration of Aba Abdullah al Hussein is concerned? Yes? What is our role? One of it is social and political and in religious activism. Meaning what? Let me give you an example. But before that, I would like to request the dear brothers to move forward as much as possible to allow space for the mu'mineen that are coming later. Please move forward with salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Recite salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. A third salawat for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. <laughs> Today there is a need to rise to the responsibility as far as presenting the beautiful teachings of the religion of Islam and the Ahl al-Bayt is concerned. You ask me, are there any practical examples of this? Let me give you an example. A group of youth in the United Kingdom several years ago noticed that the name of the grandson of the Holy Prophet is only mentioned and remembered within certain centers around the world. That many were thirsty for being inspired by great individuals like the grandson of the Holy Prophet Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. They came together and they established this particular project known as whois.org.
through the last few years now they have over 40 40 representatives around the world from Mexico to New Zealand to Zimbabwe they have what over 1.5 million views on the website they have organized activities like what like blood donation like feeding the homeless like bi uh, printing billboard signs cards distributing water bottles organizing candle vigils yes today especially in this muharram there are over 80 events that are happening around the world in order to present the teachings of this great individuals to the non-muslims and do you know what the impact has been do you know what many non-Muslims' response has been when it comes to this project who is Hussein.org? Many have stood to admire and truly have been inspired. One New York City policeman tweeted last year, he said, I don't know who this Hussein is, and I've never heard who this Hussein is, but he surely must be a great man because he has inspired so much kindness. A homeless man in London, and this clip that was produced has been viewed or has been accessed by 250,000 people. A homeless man, when he was given the food by the whoishussein.org brothers, he was given the food, he looked at it and said, you know, this food, I feel this food is from Hussein. He said, this food I feel is from Hussein. It is like uh, the feeling that Hussein is giving me this food. Wow. Yes, much more can be said. Let me give you of a story of one particular individual. Yes, her name is Jessie Davis here in the United States. This particular lady, she emailed and wrote to the organization. She said to them that I became a Muslim in 1997. Yet afterwards, I was disgruntled with what is happening. Yes, I got married and I was distant away from Islam. I associated myself with other communities. Yes, and then she goes on to say, this is what she said, much I read for you, much of the Muslim world is a mess and I just feel something is missing. Then she says, I think Hussein might be it. Something was missing in her life. She came across this project. She then said, I think Hussein might be it. I think the Ahl al-Bayt might be it. Hussein's self-sacrifice, his commitment to justice, what? It does not just blow my mind. It puts everything into perspective. That's why I'd like to learn more about this man. Tell me, when you receive something like this, and the possibilities and the opportunities that exists out there for da'wah, for propagation, for spreading the beautiful message. We have the tools. On the day of judgment, we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What excuse do we say to him when he says you live in a society that allows freedom of speech, that allows people to what? To express their faiths. Why did we not make the effort to invite individuals to appreciate and understand the beautiful values and the teachings of the religion of Islam as presented by the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, the success of who is Hussein.org, that today in this Muharram they have a program known as hashtag Hussein Inspires. And they've asked people, how does Hussein inspire you? They've asked all kinds of people to answer this question. What does Hussein mean to you? And what kind of inspiration does he bring to you? Today, as we see the success of these individuals, and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them more tawfiq, and we we ask our brothers and sisters to think outside the box to what to ensure that they put their efforts to bring this particular noble project or projects in the names of Ahl al-Bayt 
to what to every household around the world we say this we do not need just who is Hussein we need projects such as who is Muhammad who is Ali who is Fatima who are the Ahl al-Bayt and what is true Islam <laughs> And that's why organizations, blessed organizations such as Ummah are organizing this particular program known as Ummah Raise that seeks to educate and bring the skills to the community when it comes to facing political, social challenges, trains them of how to deal and be proactive when it comes to these matters, da'wah and all the projects that are happening around what? Around the different centers such as this particular blessed center when it comes to propagation should be what taken seriously why Hussein ibn Ali inspires because on the 10th he would never give up inviting others towards the right path wow. one time after the other throughout the journey from Medina to Mecca from Mecca to Karbala sermon after sermon, speaking to people, after people, tell me a man by the name of Ubaidullah ibn al-Hurr al-Ju'fi. On this journey to Karbala, he stands, he sits in a place known as Qasr Bani Muqatil. Aba Abdullah al Hussein sends him a message, says, join the caravan of freedom, of righteousness, of virtue. He rejects. Do you know what the Imam does to him? He himself goes to his tent. He sits next to this man, Ubaidullah, and says, Oh, Ubaidullah, you fought against my father, Amir al muminin This is your chance for tawbah. Come and join me, and I guarantee you success in Akhirah. To the extent that the Imam would go to people. Yes, we are have a beautiful narration from Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. <laughs> which described the Holy Prophet of Islam as an individual who is a physician would go to people and heal them. Today doctors are in a hospital or in a surgery. People go to them and explain their problems. Amir al muminin says, no, the Prophet himself used to go to people to provide them with spiritual healing. He used to find the opportunities and seize the chance that exists in order to guide. And you know, none of this is for the objective of converting others. Please understand this, that when we talk about propagation and da'wah, today it's about mis clearing the misconceptions, clearing the myths, the misunderstandings that exists out there in many parts of the Western world about what a Muslim is, what are the practices of Muslims, how they treat women, their opinion when it comes to what others all this is about what presenting them with the true teachings and guidances from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we become the tools for this particular guidance isn't it so this is an important matter for us to take into consideration but another crucial one that we learn from the 10th of Muharram that Aba Abdullah no doubt inspires us is what is the idea of the objective behind the movement of Sayyid Shuhada. And that is what? And that is to establish reform. This word reform, Islah, sometimes brings some kind of uncomfortable feeling in the minds of some people. Yes? I say, what do you mean when we talk about reform? The Imam alayhi salam would come forward and say, Inni lam akhruj ashiran wala batiran wala zaliman wala mufsida. I did not leave to waste time, neither to spread corruption or evil. Innama kharajtu li talab al islah fi ummati jaddi. I have left so that I seek reform in the ummah of my Prophet. Uridu an a'mara bil ma'roof wa anha anil munkar. I wish to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. There are many reformists in history, yes? People who sought to change things for the better. People like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther who came forward with ideas in order to what? Improve what he thought needs to be done yet of course there is no better reformer in the history of mankind like the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa
For we find a society gripped with hatred, gripped with idolatry, gripped with a lack of any direction. He brought them together and the Quran says He united their hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala united the hearts of people through the Holy Prophet of Islam These individuals who used to fight yes who used to fight against each other over the simplest of matters the camel has crossed over your side you have taken for instance an individual who does not belong to you and this was the cause by which led many battles and confrontations yet to Look at the beauty of the Holy Prophet. Yes, we are told in one of the battles, several of the injured who were Muslim were bought for water. When one of them was bought water, he said, no, I wish the other injured person, my brother drinks first. This man will goes to the other person. That person says, no, I want that individual who is lying in the battlefield. He's worse than me. Go and feed him. This man says, I went to the third person. I want to feed him. I saw that he has been martyred. I went back to the second person. I saw that he's been martyred. I, I went to the first person. I saw that he's left this world to that extent that he inculcated this brotherhood and love and unity amongst their hearts. Yes. And the reform was truly magnificent. Yet there is a reason why the Prophet says Hussein minni wa ana min Hussein. Hussein is from me. Yes. Of course, we understand that Hussein is the son of Fatima, who is the daughter of Rasulullah. But when it means ana min Hussein means what? That I am from Hussein, it means Hussein is carrying forward and will establish the reforms that I started. This is the reform that Imam al Hussein invites you and I to think about. In which way this islah needs to be understood? When we look at our practices, when we look at our, for instance, ibadah, the way we practice our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way we deal other, with other human beings, with our family members, sometimes habits, sometimes certain uh, trends that emerge in our lives. We need to press the pause button and reflect because a stagnant community is a failed community. A community that reforms is the one that attains success, isn't it? That stagnation is not part of the teachings of the religion of Islam, whereas reform is indeed. We ask the question, is there anything that is influencing our deen outside Islamic teachings? Are we placing that over our religion? When it comes to our practices, Imam alayhi salam, what inspires us from his teachings is what? Is to self scrutinize is to conduct this notion of introspection within ourselves and ask which areas of my life what are in accordance to Sharia law and which are not the fourth area of great importance that we seek inspiration from the epic and the tragedy of Karbala is the way we establish ourselves as communities living in the West. Meaning what? This comes into two dimensions. The first is with regards to the Shia community and how we conduct ourselves with each other. And the second is when it comes to the Muslim community, the way we deal with our brothers and sisters from other schools of thought. When it comes to us as a community, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, yes? How do we view the other? How do we treat the other? It's disappointing when we come and we hear people being labeled. This man follows this marja. This man follows this path. This man does this. This group of people ask this. And it spreads what division? It spreads disunity. It creates friction and hatred. Yes, which what destabilizes the community, destabilizes the potential to develop and to progress in society. That's why we are told that the first thing that the Prophet of Islam established in Medina when he reached was what? Brotherhood between the migrants as well as the helpers. The Prophet of Islam could have done this later, could have said, you know what, this brotherhood can take place later, let me establish my state first, and then I would work towards this goal. Yet he recognized that without unity, without brotherhood, we will not be able to progress as a community. That unity and brotherhood and the strength that it comes with it is integral for the success. That when we come together, the Quran comes forward and says, 
come together with the rope of Allah and do not be disunited. The Quran says whoever calls for disunity will attain God's punishment. Yes, sadly today we have too many fitna mongers. How people, their 24 hours a day, their job is to cause friction and to spread rumors and to make people scholars, between scholars, yes, between leaders of communities, between different centers, between different families. Let's not give them a platform. Let's not give them a chance. Let's not feed on suspicion and gossip and people trying to plant the seeds of discord and hatred. Yes, look at the stance of the Imam السلام, on the 10th and on the night of the 10th, such as a night like this, when he would bring the companions together, isn't it? When he would establish this strong bond between them. Likewise, when it comes to our conduct, in reference to our brothers and sisters from other schools of thought that there is no doubt that in unity there is strength and when it comes to unity with the Muslim brothers and sisters today is of the utmost importance how is this the case that when we speak about this proximity or this cohesiveness within the Muslim Ummah we are not saying that we should compromise our principles and values not at all when I come and speak about unity and bridging the gap between other the Muslim schools of thought I say that I respect your opinions you respect mine I will never kill you make sure you don't kill me make sure you don't side because today what we have is the rise of extremism through unity we can isolate the extremists today we need our brothers and sisters from the Ahlul Sunnah to stand up and condemn the atrocities that are committed against the Shia and this is a message to my dear brothers and sisters from the Ahlul Sunnah yes a message of love, a message of peace, a message of a hand that extends in unity so that we stand together under the banner of the religion of Islam and the leadership of the Holy Prophet in order to fight extremism, in order to indeed stand against ideologies such as Wahhabism, such as ISIS and Daesh. We stand together for the common good because we are a Muslim community that is united by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet as well as his family. And we learn from the sacrifice of Sayyid al-Shuhada the values of unity. You know when Imam alayhi salam was approached by the army of Hur, what happened? He saw this army is doing what they wanted to do. Do you know what they said? They said it's time for prayers. If Imam's mentality was like, was like some of us, would say, you know what, sorry, you can't join me in prayer. I don't want to pray with you. But the Imam would say, it's up to you. Would you like to join me in prayer? They said, Hur would say, who wouldn't want to stand and pray behind the son of Fatima? Yes, that is what, that is the values that the Imam alayhi salam want us to establish. But importantly, we should educate our children from a young age with this notion of respect, tolerance and unity. We should teach them this. We should not harbor resentment and hatred of the other, lest the future generations, God forbid, we will lose them and they will go the other direction when it comes to what? Extremism, because today, Extremism exists within certain quarters of the Shia world, much less than what much exists uh, that exists in other parts of the Muslim world, but it does exist. Today, our maraja have said, as far as individuals who are respected and revered by our brothers, the Ahl Sunnah, we must understand this. There must not be any public defamation. There must not be any public la'na of these individuals. Why our ulama understand the sensitivity of this current situation? Today, we have to build the society. We have to show a united force. Today, we have to stand Sunni and Shia and say no to terrorism, no to Daesh, no to these individuals who have hijacked the beautiful name of our religion. Today, when we do this, they will be inspired more by examples like Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And the other element, and of course, the ocean 
and the university of values of Aba Abdullah cannot be covered in a few minutes, no doubt. But there is one other important inspiration that we learn from the grandson of the Holy Prophet, and that is our relationship with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and our faith. What do we mean? We mean that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram makes sure that he stops to perform his salah, he stops to recite his namaz, he spends the night alongside his companions and his family members in recitation of the Quran and the remembrance of God and Salatul Layl. This highlights the need for us to be what? To be motivated from the example of the Imam as far as our faith and practice is concerned. Right. Let me tell you, it worries me today that I hear some of the brothers and the sisters sometimes some of the youth they come forward what do they say one sister asked me personally she said can you tell me is it allowed to have a 21st century hijab I said to her what does this mean you want the hijab to have Gucci and Armani on it <laughs> another person from the youth came and said can I be a gay Muslim because there is a gay Imam somewhere in Canada and in Paris, yes? Can I be a gay Muslim? And questions like these, today, what are we facing? We are facing the rise of what materialistic tendencies in the West and the decline in spirituality. Whether we like it or not, let's wake up and smell the coffee. Yes, that is happening. That when we learn from Aba Abdullah, we have to recognize what is my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But importantly, how am I making this religion, these principles of this beautiful religion, relevant to the youth and the children? Relevant means what? Some of them are asking, is Islam relevant to my life in the 21st century? In which way they're asking this? There is a tendency today, as I refer or I call to it, that people are practicing what is known as the microwave religion. Do you know what that means? What does a microwave do? A microwave, you normally heat food in it. But normally what do you do? You buy these ready meals or you have bought some kind of food from uh, a restaurant and you've come home and you use it to heat. Yes, it takes a few minutes and it's ready to eat. Yes, microwave religion means what? That sometimes people out there want the easy way out. They want, you know, ways just simply to get to whatever they want to get and they use religion in there example or in their lives to say what is there a loophole is there someone they don't want to put the effort and the struggle just like how they don't want to cook necessarily and they don't want to put their effort into preparing food what happens is they want islam to be like a meal they put onto the microwave and it's ready for them they want it simple oh but brother this is hard oh but brother i'm facing this oh but brother but you know when it comes to hijab it's very difficult for me to wear it oh when it comes to praying in my workplace it's not easy oh when it comes to for instance being active in society i am not really a, an individual who has the time people give excuses why they want the easy life they want to simply, you know, just get along and do whatever they wish to do. Notice that Amir al muminin wa Imam al muttaqin Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salam says what? He comes forward and says, Allah wa inna thamana anfusakum al jannah. The price of your soul is paradise. فَلَا تُبِيعُوهَا إِلَّا بِهَا Do not sell your soul for anything other than paradise. Today, that realization should be in our minds. Whom are we selling our souls to? Are we selling our souls to what? To celebrity culture? We look at the way the celebrities dress and for the men, the way they cut their hair and for the women, the way they dress and so on and so forth and they become our role models yes do we come to islam and pick and choose from it that which we like and that which we dislike we say you know what i leave it on the side 
no problem. Maybe one day I'll come back to it. Are we people who can stand to say that we are working to establish what? This proximity, this relationship, this noor that is obtained from the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as salam in order to get us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and utilizing the message and making our youngsters what? Recognize the value of the religion and how adhering to religious principles and values gives them happiness, success, tawfiq in dunya and akhirah. Is that something that we are doing? Are we putting the efforts or not? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves, especially on a night like this. Because why? Today, one important act that we must encourage that brings this spirituality up, that brings what this connection stronger. You know, I always say to the youth, many of us, when we go to different places, we have our cell phones, yes? When we have our cell phones, we normally look at the reception or the signal, yes? If it's weak, if it's strong, sometimes we go to remote areas, we can't make a call. Sometimes we go other places, we want the internet connection and it's not very strong, yes? When we go to Ziyara, the bars, when it comes to the connection with Allah, is much more. When we pay the visits to the shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt, tell me, we put the money and the efforts to go to Disneyland, to go to Dubai, to go to India. Yes, go to all these places, no problem. But don't come and say, you know what, I can't afford to go to Karbala. I can't afford to go to Najaf. It's difficult to take my family over there. It's difficult for me to perform the Umrah or the Hajj with these visitations, with these ziyaras. There are impacts that you and I are not able to understand. By being there, we receive the blessings and the mercy of these holy places. <laughs> Our fifth Imam would say, would come forward, peace and blessings be upon him, and would say, encourage the Shia to perform the ziyara of the shrine of Aba Abdullah because it increases rizq, sustenance. It prolongs the life. It removes evil. There are so many benefits, yes? We are told the ziyara of Imam al Hussein. for every step we take, what? Thousands of... Hasanat are obtained and thousands of sayyat are removed. Let us bring that light to the hearts of our children and our youth and our women, ourselves. Let's go there and see the transformation that can happen and the life-changing experience. As it happened to a particular lady in Europe, she was an individual who would come forward and say, you know what, I have nothing. A lady who is from the school of Ahl al-Bayt, she would say, I have nothing to do when it comes to what hijab. And she was not really practically practicing very much when it comes to her faith. One of her family members convinced her to go to Karbala when she came back. She said that I was wrong and today she stands to defend hijab more than any other time. She wears the hijab, she speaks about the hijab. Indeed, when we find and we see the light, we can be inspired. That's why on a night like this, when we have commemorated the shahada and the sacrifice of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, it's time to make a pledge. It's time on a night like this to open our hearts and to speak to this great man who has inspired millions, isn't it? And to say to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, we are those who claim to be your supporters. We are those who claim to be individuals who call your name. We cry for you. We beat our chests. We practice as a dari. We attend the majalis. We know that attendance is very, very important. And we recognize that we must attend these majalis. Ya Aba Abdullah, we want you to welcome us and allow us to be of those whom you bless in dunya and attain the shafa'a in akhirah. Ya Aba Abdullah, we want to pledge that this is the moment of transformation in our lives, the moment of change. Indeed, every one of us 
has aspects in our lives that we wish to improve, isn't it? Don't tell me that you are the complete package. No one is. Starting with myself, we utilize these moments on the night of Ashura where we have millions congregated in Karbala on a night like this, chanting Labbayka Ya Hussein, crying over Aba Abdullah Al Hussein. This is the night to connect. This is the night to pledge. This is the night to establish the covenants of loyalty, sacrifice, devotion towards the movement and the revolution and the uprising and the inspiration that is Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Right. Right. On a night like this, tell me, what were the companions thinking of? You know, we have so many narrations about those individuals who were truly the best of the people at that time, the creme de la creme, so to speak, people whose main concerns with one man, yes? That's why on a night like this, we are told on the eve of Ashura, Imam alayhi salam leaves his tent, goes to see what is happening, goes to plan and the uh, battle the next day behind him he has he hears someone walking he finds is a man by the name of Hilal ibn Nafi he says Hilal and Hadha Hilal says, Yabna Rasulillah, may I be ransomed for you I will sacrifice my life for you indeed it is me Imam says oh Hilal come next to me Hilal comes to the Imam do you know what the Imam says to him? He says, Hilal, look, there are the darkness of the night. Look at the darkness of the night. If you leave, no one will see you. Why don't you save yourself? Go, leave. Don't worry about the bay'ah that you have given me. Hilal falls onto the feet of Aba Abdullah. Says, Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah, may I be cut into pieces. May my sword be drenched with the blood fighting to defend you. I will never leave you. That's why Imam al Hussein would gather his companions, would say to them, Oh, the people of righteousness. Oh, the people who have stood to support the family of the Holy Prophet. Yes, let every one of you take what a member of my family and what my covenant with you is no longer established. I am allowing you to leave. Go and save yourself because these wretched individuals want me. They want to kill me. Yes, one after the other, starting with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. They would stand and say, Ya Hussein, how can we leave you? How can we desert you? How can we be unloyal to you? Zuhair ibn al Qain stands and said, Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah, if I am killed and bought back and killed and bought back a thousand times, I will never leave you. Another man would stand and say, Ya Hussein, if I am burnt and bought back, I will never leave you. Imam would say, Jazakumullah. Then he would show them their position in Jannah. They would spend the night in ibadah, in prostration, in remembrance of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no doubt that on the 10th of Muharram, not a single one of them disappointed. Not a single one of them stood back, but they charged like lions of God, defending the sacredness and the sanctity of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. That's why Imam al Hussein, when he saw his family members and his companions all massacred before him, he looks on the right and he finds the bodies of Ali and al Akbar and al Qasim. He looks on the left and he finds the bodies of Zuhair and Habib ibn Mudahir. He calls out Allah al min nasir yansurna Allah al min mughith yughithuna Allah 
هل من ذاب يذب عن حرم رسول الله is there anyone to help us is there anyone that will come to our assistance is there anyone who will defend the sacredness of the family of the prophet Imam Zain al-Abidin who was ill yes Imam Zain al-Abidin heard this he could not stand he said to his auntie Zainab give me a stick and give me a sword his auntie Zainab said why he said I cannot be hearing my father calling for help and me not responding Imam al Hussein enters the tent now he sees his son Imam Zain al-Abidin wants to stand up he says to him my son Zain al-Abidin Ali remain for you have to stay alive so that the line of the Ahl al-Bayt remains one narration says that Imam came and whispered something to the ears of Imam Zain al-Abidin do you know what he said Imam al Hussein said to his son he said Ablaq Shi'ati minni salam inform my Shia that I am sending their salams we say to him Ya Aba Abdullah alayka minni salam you grant the salam to us we respond the salam to you arguably one of the most difficult moments for the Imam then followed how he saw his daughter Sukain coming towards him saying my father my father this is my brother Ali and Al Azhar he is thirsty he hasn't had any water for a long period ask those people maybe they will bring some water for this young infant Imam Al Hussein picks up the infant looks at the infant the six month old had stopped crying because there was no more energy those thirsty uh, he comes out uh, yes at that moment uh, we are told uh, that Umar bin Sa'ad Harmala others were looking to see what happens uh, Harmala says that on the 10th of Muharram I had a number of arrows that penetrated I had a number of arrows that reached a target uh, one of the arrows was when I saw Abbas standing on the horse without any arms I pointed the arrow and I pierced through his eyes yes the other arrow is the one that made the water container spill he says but one of the most difficult arrows is when Hussein came he had something under his cloak he lifted the baby he said oh people if you have a problem with the elders what is the fault of the children Children. look at this young six month old he has not tasted water take him feed him give him water he says the people of Umar bin Sa'ad some started crying some said let's give him water Umar bin Sa'ad said by God they will never get any water oh Harmala stop the discussion of the people he said I heard this I recognize that I have to do one thing Allahu Akbar today doctors say that when it comes to treating children when they give an injection they use a small needle huh they use a small needle because an adult needle hurts the child the child is too young the skin is sensitive the flesh is still young Harmala said I took an arrow that is used to shoot against an adult I looked at the baby and I noticed the whiteness of his neck and I shot an arrow that pierced through the neck of this young child. It indeed went through from one side to the other and he started flapping like a bird that was just slaughtered. <laughs> note uh, how Imam al Hussein would have felt uh, seeing his six month old slaughtered before him the blood gushed out he filled his hands with the blood of Ali and al Azhar he lifted it towards the heavens Imam al Baqir says not a single drop came down the Malaika took the blood Imam said Allahumma taqabbal minna hadha al qurba 
الرحمن هون ما نزل بي أنه بعين الله Allah is watching this this is what is allowing me to bear the pain and the torment when he wrapped the child under his cloak he came back Sayyidah Zainab Sukaina they came out they said oh Aba Abdullah it is like that the child has been fed it is, seems that he has been given water he takes Ali and Al Azgar out he says take this children child who has been slaughtered the women come round they cry out they beat their heads and chests they say why young mother why young shaheed Allahu Akbar how did his mother hear this the mothers cannot bear hearing that a six month old child what is the, the fault of a six month old that's why on Sham Gariba we are told Rabab came out they said to her oh Rabab where are you going she said I have no milk I am looking for my son Ali I want to feed my son Ali in Al Azhar <laughs> ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين This is the night of Ashura May Allah bless these tears May Allah bless the commemoration of the tragedy of Karbala 